Good evening and welcome to Finding Answers Live. I'm your host, Chris Boudram, and tonight we're going to be speaking about debts. Now, I know there are many people out there in the UK today who have got lots and lots of debts and they're tearing their hair out, they just don't know what to do. Well, tonight we have a special guest on who had huge debt problems, but she managed to get herself out of them and she's going to be sharing her story with us a little later on. But first, let's go with, to Barbara, who's going to interview some people and here's what they had to say. As we know, a build-up of debts in the UK has pretty much reached an all-time peak. Average British households in 7,900 of debt as wages drop. So at times like this, we need to think, how can we turn financial debt into financial success? I think you could uh, like not do shopping, like, you know, long clothes and try to cut a bit because, um, like, in these days, it's really hard to get money and so you should try to save up money. There are people that are struggling because the government don't really care about us. They just cutting down, cutting down, cutting down, but they don't care about us. They don't ask what's wrong, what we need or nothing. Hopefully the government invest in more job opportunities. That's one way. Working online, online businesses. Um, that's it. Save. Don't go out as much. I mean, I'm in debt as, at the moment £3,000, so... I don't go out as much and stuff like that. Just be more wiser with money. If you've got stuff that you don't need at home, you can like sell on eBay and start like that. Things uh, that can look for a job uh, everywhere, like in restaurant or cafe. Up to these people, if they do it, it's good for them if they work. Like if they do low job, they, they can find a, a higher job after that. Well, I think the main thing that they could do is set up a business because if you set up a business, like there's more income that can be um, created in your household. You can actually at least try to stop using your credit cards, start w saving up money and then start using it like that. Instead of creating more debts and debt, like, it will just keep increasing, it won't go down. Do you know anyone who's, got, who's in any debt? Yeah, my mum. And what's she going to do? I I'm trying to make her stop using, getting loans and all that. And that way it will go down slowly, slowly, and then it will just stop after that. Because once you get one loan, you, you want to buy, you want to get another one, just because you're paying like a little bit monthly by monthly. That's why we be better like that. That's it for me. Now back to Chris. Okay, not a nice situation, is it, to be in debt? And I know sort of people say, oh, you need to cut back, don't don't buy clothes, don't go out. But for someone that's in that situation, that makes life really hard and really boring because, you know, you want to have fun as well. You want to go out, spend a bit of money every now and then, buy yourself some new clothes, go to a restaurant. And people in debt normally don't get to do these things, or if they do, they just end up getting themselves in more debt. But there is light at the end of the tunnel because, like I said before, we do have a special guest on who's going to share what she did to get herself out of debt. But first, I'd like to say hello to Pastor Miguel from the UCKG Help Centre. Hello, Pastor. Hello, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? Excellent. As debts, you said, there is always light debts. at the end of debt. As you said, mm. there is always light at the end of the tunnel. But you see, debt is like a snowball. If you don't deal with it in the beginning, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point that it will be impossible to bear. Mm. And that's where some people, you know, turn turning to alcohol so that they can forget their problems. Which is expensive. Which is expensive mm -hmm. as well. Some people, they, you know, uh, they just want to chill and, and feel relaxed and they go for cigarettes, which is also expensive. Some people spend, you know, m hundreds of pounds every week on cigarettes. There are people that are living like this. Plus, when desperation hits the heart and the person doesn't know what to do anymore, where do they go to? Loans and loans, and when they think they're getting rid of their debt, they go for another loan just so that they could erase one, but making others mm. just to suit their lives better. But in a way or another, it's getting even worse. And, you know, as this, this person is going to share with us how she managed to change her life, many people, unfortunately, they don't see a way out, so they just live with it. Some people, they carry debts with them for so many years, five, 10, 50 years. I'm not talking about um, uh, when, you, when you buy a house, mortgage. A mortgage I'm not to yeah. talking about mortgage. I'm talking about debts. Mortgage is when you, know, you, you are able to pay monthly a certain amount. Everything is okay, your life is, your life is fine. But debts, that means you are below average. You are below zero. You are your life is just going down mm. in all points 
all situations it's in really your life. It's really stressful because I remember I remember having like taken out a loan once, and even though it wasn't that much, and I was able to afford the the payments, but yes. I didn't have much left over at the end of it. And it's just a stressful situation mm -hmm. of knowing like, oh, I've got this thing hanging over me, and you yes. just don't you don't you can't relax. You're always worried about making sure that you make the payments, and then you've got this, still this much to to pay, and then there's the interest mm -hmm. as well. So it's very stressful. Mm -hmm. But this is one of the easiest ways that people find to get money there in yeah. their hands, right? Which is what everyone needs. And one thing that concerns me a lot, Chris, as you were saying, it's like, imagine a person that has 30,000 in debts, 25,000 in debts, 50,000 yeah. in debts, and they are working every single day from nine to five and earning 1,200 pounds, 1,000 pounds. And this person needs to pay electricity bill, gas bill, water bill, rent, um, transport, food for the house, council tax, council tax clothes, clothes for the children, mm -hmm. certain expenses here and there. And what is left? 200 pounds, 150 pounds, 300 pounds for if, the rest of the month. Anything left. If there is anything left. <laughs> for leisure. Plus mm -hmm. the debts. I mean, it, it, it might be a stressful situation indeed, because this is what I am getting. I need to pay these debts. If I just take 50 pounds out, you know, how am I going to pay 25,000 if I'm just able to separate 100 pounds at the end of the month to pay 1,000 of 25,000? Mm -hmm. So that's where many people get desperate. And not to say even suicidal, yeah. because they feel like they are, there is no way out, right? Yes. So this is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And hopefully with, with um, bring um, enlightenment to you so that you may know how to deal with your finances, what you can do to change the situation that you are living at this present moment. Okay, so you brought along a guest, Pastor. Yes, um, we have here Vida with us. In my language, it says Vida, which means life, right, Vida? <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> and you, you, you had this uh, very stressful moment in your life when you were in debts, yes. right? Yes. You're going to share a little bit more of your story with us in a few moments. Would you like to give them the contact details if they yes. want to get in touch with us? Yeah. If you would like to share your experience, are you in debt and how are you managing to cope with it? Are you managing to pay things off or are you struggling? You can give us a call 020-7686-6300. Pastor, we'll be praying for them as well at the end yes. of the show. Yep. So Pastor, we'll be saying a prayer for you towards the end of the show as well. You can also email on answers at findinganswers.tv or send us a text 0751-637-2552. So over to Vida now. So before you get onto the, the debt part and the, the money problems and stuff, take us through how your childhood was. Was everything good or not so good for you? Actually, I would say I had a very good upbringing. Um, I'm the only child to my mom, mm -hmm. but my dad had five children, which I didn't know them. And my dad didn't support my mom to bring me up. And my mom was young then, so my, my grandmother wanted my mom to get married again. So I was sent to my grandmother in the village to live with her, who was a very religious person. Mm -hmm. So I used to go to church all the time, but it didn't make any difference in my life. And I used to do everything that everybody does, like gossip and fornication, adultery, swearing, mm -hmm. though I was going to church. But I come back and I do whatever everybody does. Why would you go then? Why would you go to church? It was a formal thing in my, in my family. It was a principle that you have to go to church. And if I don't go to church, I don't eat. Don't it would you? come to this extent. Yes. If I decide not to go to church, my grandmother and the whole family will leave me to go to church and they'll lock all the doors and I'll be sitting outside. And that, for me not being with them, rather took me to a different level, like going out and doing everything within my own power. Mm -hmm. That was when I would go with other people and we gossip. We do all things that a child shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. and then I, so instead of, you know, willingly and happily going to the church, you were forced to go there. Yeah. And you were kind of, um, how can I say, pressurized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Because no church, 
no food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know, you said you were you were going there because you were forced to go, but nothing would change in your life, and you would just live your life the way you were living. Was it just because you you were not interested in listening to what they had to say, or? It was something that didn't make sense for you at the time. It didn't make any sense to me at mm -hmm. all. Because what were they telling you to do? I read the Bible like a storybook. It didn't give me anything back. And I go to church, I sing. The only thing that I enjoyed going to church was to sing and dance. And if I mean dancing, it's not just, it's a proper dancing because I was brought up in Africa anyway. So it was an emotional dance. You dance and you sweat, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So that, that was the only thing that I it's enjoyed. It's like a temporary relief of your problems, right? Exactly. And I have you know, spoken to many people, Chris, that they are living like this. And they are going to the church it's just to socialize. Mm -hmm. They go there to have tea and biscuits and to dance, like you said, many uh, culture, co cultures, right? They, invite their friends and let's go to church and they dance and they sing and whilst they are in there obviously you tend to forget about your problems because you are in an environment where you're just dancing and singing and nothing else is being done to deal with your problems or even take you to God hmm. was this how you felt exactly pastor because there's a point where you I only go because I've been given a new dress or a new shoes they've bought me a new thing so I'm just going to show off mm -hmm and come back and that was it and I come back and it's the same thing so it's what it was like one life in front inside of the church and another life outside exactly of the church. Mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. because I know that it, it teaches you not to do certain things like everything in life everything has got a law or a rule but I come back and I do the contrary I do the opposite mm -hmm. perhaps because you didn't have the strength to say no because you were being taught, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's not enough, I do believe in this, it's not enough to learn or to be taught. It's, it's, you need to have this desire in your mm -hmm. heart to do what is right. You have to have this desire, maybe this fear, this respect about life, about yourself, maybe that God places inside of mm -hmm. us so that we may do what is right, which in your case, you, were, you went the wrong way. Yeah, how, so. how active were you in the church? Very what active. Of, what kind of things you did apart from singing? I used to read the Bible in the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I used to, and I used to help the children in the church. It wasn't a Sunday school for mm -hmm. children, but I used to be what they call an usher. So when people are coming, you usher them in. Okay. You give them a place to sit. So did you used to go out as well and tell people about the church? And oh stuff? yes, oh yes. I used to go out to do what we call a dawn broadcast. We go very early in the morning and just shout on the mic, telling people about... Oh, like the people in Oxford Street sometimes, they're just there shouting on, on the street corners. Exactly. Annoying everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. At dawn. At dawn. Then people used to complain. No, the, you see people opening their windows to see what is going on. Did that anyone was... ever call the police? No. There's no such a thing in where I was brought oh, up. Oh, okay, in so Africa. if you tried it over here, yeah. you'd get a bucket of water thrown over you, I think, at that time. Yeah, so morning. that's what I used to do. Mm -hmm. But it didn't change my life. And I don't know how it why affected me. Why would you do those things? Why, why would you get into that stuff if you didn't really kind of believe in it or really. It was a routine. Mm. If I look back, the best way I can describe it is getting up in the morning. You know you have to wash your face, you know you, know you have to clean your teeth. Mm. It's a normal thing for you to do. So that's how I was doing it without any meaning attached mm. to what I was doing. So what kind of things were you getting up to then? So you were a church girl. Yeah, a show off girl. Yeah. yeah. But what were you actually doing outside of church when people weren't looking? Very bad things. Gossip. Mm -hmm. Gossip was my best part of everything. And I was really disrespectful to everyone. Anger mm. was one of them. Mm. Why were you angry? Rage. I was really angry because I felt lonely, because I was the only child. And the Even though you had your gran? I had my gran. My gran was a very strong, powerful woman who never went to school, but had a grocery shop. Mm -hmm. So she was always in the shop. Okay. So, so I yeah, had, and yeah. luckily, I had like a maid servant in the house. So I never used to do anything like cooking, cleaning, or helping. 
So I was always outside doing whatever pleases me. Mm. You know, it's a rage. I was fighting a lot. I used to fight because I gossip and people get to hear about it. <laughs> so get into the, trouble. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I'll get beaten up and I'll really? fear. And I'll fight people who I'm not supposed to fight. It's because I didn't have self-respect. Mm. Yeah. So I was always, always, always angry. But the anger was the fact that I didn't have any discipline in life. And most importantly, I felt lonely because if I see siblings talking together, I mm. feel very jealous. So you hadn't actually met your, your father's other children then? No, at that time I didn't know them. Oh, you didn't know, okay, sorry. I didn't, but mm. I knew I had siblings somewhere. But at that time I didn't have the power to go and look for them mm -hmm. because I was a bit young. So. I, did, I knew where they were, but I couldn't go to them. Okay. But if I see two siblings, like a brother and sister, I feel so jealous. And that alone will make me fight them. Your dad wasn't around. My and, dad had wasn't. Other and you knew he had other children. Yeah. And you knew, you knew there were siblings, but you couldn't contact them. Yeah. Your mum wasn't around. Look, being looked after by your grand, but then she was working mm -hmm. most of the time. So mm -hmm. you were really lonely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I quite remember I used to cry a lot, plugging my hair and scratching myself. Why would you scratch yourself? Especially when my mom comes to visit and she's leaving. I feel so lonely that I, I, I sometimes even chase after the car. So you really had an internal problem, right? Yeah. Because apparently all the physical needs were supplied. Mm -hmm. Your grandmother, you said, or your yeah. auntie, your grandmother yeah. had the shop, you had maid servants. You know, you didn't even need to cook. No. Uh, uh, you mentioned as well that you would be given new clothes, new shoes. So apparently, physically speaking, you were yeah. fulfilled. Yeah. But none of what you had were really satisfying what was going on inside. Not at you all. You always felt lonely. Not at and all. And that caused you to get into trouble. Yes. Fast forward in life, how did you, how did you go into debts and all the problems that you were facing? I got married. Back home or here? Back home. Mm -hmm. We came to England together. And within two years, the marriage broke up. And I was on my own, illegal in the country. Why? Was there any reason? Yeah, why did, it, why did it break up? If I look back, it's because of anger. So you still um, hadn't resolved that? No. So the problem that you were carrying right yeah. when you were a teenager yeah. was still inside? You see, that's why we normally say, Chris, um, a man that has a, a problem of uncontrollable anger, how is this man going to be when he becomes a husband? Yeah. A man that has a problem of pornography and this problem is not dealt with, how faithful is he going to be to his wife when this problem is not dealt with? A woman that has had issues in the past like abuse or or mistreated by the family or whatever it is. If this problem is not dealt with and they get married and they bring this luggage on their shoulders into the marriage, it's mm -hmm. like um, you already have problem, I have problem, so let's add my bomb with your bomb and see what type of explosion it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So this is what happened to you. Yes, you exactly. brought a bomb into your marriage, yeah. right? Yeah. A time bomb. Yeah. And it exploded yeah. and devastated everyone. Yes. So it got to a point there was no respect in the relationship anymore. And I was just fighting a losing battle. So I just, I was, I was always waiting for an opportune time to throw in the towel and run away. And that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. I just left. Did you marry for love? At the time, I, did, I was pushed into marriage because I was the only child. So what I can remember vividly was get married and have a family of your own mm -hmm. so that your family will become your brothers and sisters. And this lonely would eventually go away. Yeah. But I remember when I went into the marriage, the first few years I knew it was not for me. Mm -hmm. But I was just trying, trying to work it out. But because of anger, it didn't work out. And at the time we separated, I was illegal in the country. And that was when the debt started coming in. How did you manage to, to get the debts? What did you do? 
my visa expired immediately after the divorce. So I couldn't work. And at that time, you know when letters come through your post, you can apply for this, you can apply for credit card. So at that time, though I was doing odd jobs, and in very less, but I had up to about six credit cards. Six credit cards, yeah. gosh. And I believe that all the credit in the card was gone, right? I was spending every, I... What were you spending on there? Was it like necessities, food and things, or were you actually just splashing out and buying things? Like at a time... Expensive clothes and things like that. At a time, I thought it was necessity, but it wasn't. Because mm. I, 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 I was living alone, but I could buy food more than enough for myself. And I used to give things out without, even if I don't know you and you come to me, you say something, whatever I have, I'll give it to you mm -hmm. without not thinking. And I'll go from, I remember I used to go from shop to shop. Whatever I see and I like, I have to have it. I even though you to. knew you were already in debt, so exactly. you kept on doing that. Why and did you do that? I think it was just, it was a void in me. I didn't, mm. have, I didn't have any responsibility anyway. So when I get up in the morning, there's no structure in life. Mm -hmm. So I just have to get out. Especially, most importantly, when there's a sale, I'll go from shop to shop and buy whatever. Sometimes I don't need, even need them and I'll buy them. It's like an addiction really then. Yeah, so I used to mm -hmm. have loads and loads of clothes. Everything in abundance, everything, everything, mm -hmm. everything. And in, in what period of, of time did you manage to get all these debts? And how much was it in total? It's, it was almost more than 25,000 pounds. 25? Yeah. For a single woman? Yeah. Wow. But if you ask me what I used the money for... I can't remember. No. And I can't tell you that I have something valuable. <coughs> there wasn't anything valuable in my wardrobe. There wasn't anything valuable in my flat. There wasn't any savings. There wasn't nothing, nothing. So up to date, I can't say that I bought something worth about 500 pounds or 200 pounds or 1,000 pounds. You, that you kept, you kept up until today? No. You don't have There's it. no such a thing. So 25,000 oh pounds. I mean, that's money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's money. You can buy a car with it, right? And you, you don't know where it, where it is. No. Clothes? No. Cause because I used to give things away. Mm. If I had, a, I had something in mind that if something in my wardrobe and I haven't used it for a period of time, it means I'm not going to use it, mm -hmm. so I'll give it away. Some people might, that might be watching this, uh, Vi, that might, may say like this, but 25,000 pounds spent over... God knows what period it was. And you don't have anything there. This might not be wise. Mm -hmm. the, the woman wasn't wise. She didn't use her money well or worked out her life well. But we need to understand that some people, they just, they just lose control. Mm -hmm. Maybe you were just losing control. Mm -hmm. Maybe you had so much emptiness and void inside you and you just wanted to fulfill that void or, you know, acquire some stuff just so that you could forget about your problems, that you, you had this debt, right? There's, there's like people that are shopaholics or people that do certain things just so that it, they can forget the pain that they're having in, the, in their lives. Yeah. And maybe this was your case. I, I actually remember another guest that came on and she lost her grandmother, I think mm -hmm. it was. And like her sister dealt with the problem by closing up and like not speaking to anyone, but she dealt with the problem and she just used to go out and shop and shop and mm -hmm. she'd buy the same item in different colors. And that's what made her, helped her, helped her deal with her grief, or she thought she was dealing with, but obviously she was getting into debt and then she's getting more depressed, but she just couldn't control herself because she, did, she didn't know how to grieve. That mm -hmm. was the way she was doing mm -hmm. it. So she now, got into so much now, debt. Now, 25,000 pounds, and I do believe that letters would come through your letterbox. Oh, yes. Demanding things and yeah. warning you. And this is the final warning. And when it comes with the red, big final warning, how would you feel? What would you do when the letters begin piling up? Uh, did you have a job at the time? I had a job, but the job wasn't 
enough to it's sustain like said, me with, even without a debt. It's like it's, I said, nine to five, yeah. mm. a thousand per month. There's yeah. nothing left at the end yeah. of the day. And the sad thing is, because I was illegal in the country then, there was no stability. Mm. So I could have l lost my job any time without not paying for the debt. So mm -hmm. it was like, and because the debts were coming up and up all the time, I used to borrow money from somewhere, trying to pay the other one off, but it never worked. Take us through like how a person with debts feels. Depression, mm -hmm. sadness, humiliation, because I quite remember I used to walk with my head down and around me, I thought everybody knew me. That's the sense of the sense of feeling that I had. If I step out my house to go out, I thought everybody knew, oh, that girl has got so much debt. That's how I felt. Mm -hmm. So I used to walk with my head down. And because, as I said, I was lonely, I didn't have anyone to share my problems with. So you, you see me, you see me as a normal person, but inside I was just not a human being. Did you ever consider going back to your home country? I tried, but at that time I didn't have papers, so I couldn't go nowhere. Okay, you're stuck. So you felt, you felt locked, you felt like a slave, working, but I'm not enjoying my money, working to pay debts, unfulfilled, depressed, humiliated. Is this life? Yes. I remember a certain time, about two years, any time I get paid, the very first day that I would get paid, all the money would go out of the account. Really? Yes. Oh, my gosh. So I was always waiting to be paid. Every time I, I was just waiting to be paid to clear some of like the debt count, off. Countdown, right? Exactly. Counting the days. Mm -hmm. So it was like a rollout. Any time there's a credit card, I need to eat. So I would spend, I knew I shouldn't be doing it, but I didn't have any option. I didn't have anyone to go to, to ask for food. And I couldn't depend on the government either because I was illegal in the country. So it was like, Debt after debt after debt after debt. And sometimes when I see these letters, I knew where the letters were coming from. Mm -hmm. I knew, if I look at the envelope, I know who is chasing me for this money. And the letters will be piled up for months and months and months, not opening the letters at all. So you couldn't face it? I you couldn't. couldn't. face opening them? I couldn't. Now, Vida, I know things actually did get worse for you because you there was a day that you were thinking of ending it all because you couldn't take it anymore but before you tell us about that we're going to go to a quick break give our viewers a chance also to give us a call if you're going through anything like this or you know someone that is and you'd like to receive a prayer Pastor Miguel will be making the prayer towards the end of the program or if you'd like to share your experience maybe you had debts and you managed to pay them off you have some tips and advice for the viewers as well you can give us a call 020-7686-6300 you can email on answers at findinganswers.tv or send us a text 0751-637-2552 we'll be back after this break
Welcome back. And we're here speaking to Vida, who's been telling us how she managed to get herself into over £25,000 worth of debt. But it didn't end there because something else was going on as well, wasn't it, Vida? Would you like to tell us about it? Through the difficulty of paying the debt and running away from the debt, ignoring calls, through that time I realised I had hepatitis C, chronic hepatitis C. Mm. And that was when it was like a tip over. I couldn't get treatment because I was illegal. Oh gosh, you were trapped. <laughs> I started searching the net for help. The only help that was available then was in America. And I couldn't go to America mm -hmm. because of the restrictions on my visa. So I had to deal with it. And I was going from GP to GP and none of them wanted to register me. And it was- Did you ever go to the hospital? I couldn't because it, it, cost a, it cost a fortune to treat hepatitis C on NHS. Mm -hmm. So that was when my, they wanted to know my status in the country to get treated. And that was the very difficult bit. So I quite, and it, it started making me feel weak and I couldn't eat. But I think it's all boils to the fact that because I had so much, I had loneliness, I had debt, and mm -hmm. I had sickness, and I knew if, if the treatment is not, the, the, the disease that I have is not treated, I might die. That was what scares me the most. Because hepatitis, if it's not treated, you can get cirrhosis of the liver or cancer of the liver. So that was what but frightened how did, you, how did you know you had it in the first place, if you can go to a doctor? It was through uh, fertility treatment mm -hmm. that I was diagnosed. I had chronic hepatitis C. And this was when you were with your, your husband? Ex-husband, yeah. Okay. So that, that broke the marriage anyway. Right. The so at that time when you were together, you, you didn't have the financial problems and you, you could go to the yeah. doctors and everything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now you're alone, you have this disease. Did you used to get, so I don't know much about the condition, do you get pain as well? It, it wasn't a pain, but it felt like a hard burn, a very mm -hmm. sharp sensation on my right side. Yeah. But I thought it was um, eating the wrong food or something. But it was when I realized, I, I searched it on net, and I, I found out that those symptoms are very serious. You must but have I, been really scared. I was really scared. Vida, let me just bring up something here. Um, that, that you are mentioning. Growing up as a child, you were unhappy. Getting married, you was not happy. Mm -hmm. um, you, you had all this money in debts. You were not happy. Mm -hmm. And now you, you just tell us that you had chronic, how is it again? Chronic hepatitis C. Chronic hepatitis C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By all the things that you were telling us, was there any moment in your life that you could say, I'm leaving, I am happy, I'm going somewhere in life? No. How old were you when you found out about the, the hepatitis C? I was about 28 years old. 28? Yeah. So you, I, I can say that you didn't really leave in these 28 days, and, uh, years, did you? No, no. I, I, I was always thinking that I don't have luck. All the time, I, mm. I was always, always oh, thinking, lucky man. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is my, my, my life. I didn't know anything about pain. Mm. And, and the thought of, will my life ever get better some, someday? How can I get out of this situation? Or the thought of, what can I do to change my life? Did this ever cross your mind? I used or you to. Were, or you were just contemplating your life the way it was? and feeling sorry for yourself. I used to dream about having a good life, but there was no, there was no way I could see myself coming out of my problems. It's like you were in a dark room and there was no light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. And the sad thing was, at the end of the day, I don't have anyone to talk to. Mm. So it was a very cold, a very cold and a very blunt life, hoping against hope. Completely different than the way your life perhaps was back home. Yes. Because in here, uh, people are very close. They close yes, up. Yes. They don't want to talk. Exactly. It's high and by. Exactly. And that's it. Yes. Whereas back home, you, you used to gossip a lot. Yes. 
<laughs> so I can yes. I can already imagine that yes. you, you <laughs> exactly. used to have um this loneliness because back home you <laughs> Oh people gossip over here, yeah. you'd be surprised as well. <laughs> back, back home you, you used to talk a lot and you, you didn't really have anyone to talk to. Yeah. Mm. What, was your, what, what was your worst moment, Vida? My worst moment was one day I didn't have money to go to work. So I walked from where I live, South Croydon, to the West Croydon to go to work. And the thought of walking back home, because at that time I was getting weaker and weaker and weaker, because I didn't have money to eat, mm -hmm. and I knew at the back of my mind that I'm not, I'm not wow. physically strong enough to cope. And when I finished work and I was going, oh, it was raining. And oh for gosh. me, wet, soak and go into an empty room and not having any food to eat was something that it was. And I remember in that whole month, I didn't have electricity because I used to buy the electricity on a key. Mm -hmm. So the little food that I had in my fridge, I had to throw them away because the, oh there was gosh. no light in the house for a whole month. So I knew I was going to an empty house, an empty fridge, and there's no electricity, cold. and I'm wet, and I'm cold. So I decided to end it all by commuting suicide. What a, what a, what a, I, I, I can't even imagine how desperate you were, mm -hmm. Vida. I can't even imagine because you were living every single day with this problem, mm -hmm. right? feeling unhappy every single day and and the thought of I'm going to my house there is no one there to talk to there is no food eventually after a, a day of work all that he wants to do is what eat mm -hmm. I want to have a nice, a nice cozy warm house warm bath and it was just a room no electricity no hot bath no hot water no warm room in the room no food Awful. I went Awful. home and all I could do was to get a tap water. And when I was drinking the tap water, I felt, I felt so humiliated. I felt very small. And I didn't want to live anymore. And I remember I couldn't sleep. I couldn't close my eyes to sleep. I couldn't. So to top it off, you also suffered with insomnia. I, I could say that, yes. I couldn't sleep at all, but I knew the next morning I had to get up and walk to work again. So I have to have sleep. And you know, when you are forcing yourself to sleep and you can't sleep, it's the worst nightmare. Mm. I could, even if a pin would drop, I could hear the pin dropping. And that was when, and because I've always been a, a lonely child, I couldn't even pick up a phone to tell my mom what I was going through. And I felt so humiliated that I just didn't want anybody to know what I was going through. I just couldn't want anyone, anyone, to know I was having a very miserable life. Mm -hmm. So the next morning I woke up and I filled the bath. Filled my bath to the brim. I just went in, the bath was cold anyway. Oh I went in there. And when I went in and I held my nose, that was when I, what were you trying to do? Were you trying to drown yourself? Yes. So now when I was in the bath, and I, the only thought that came to my mind was my grandmother. And I knew she's a very hardworking woman, and she's done everything she could to help me, to bring me up. That was the thought that made me push myself out of the bath. And So you were literally in? I was in. I shut my eyes, I remember I shut my eyes and I could feel the cold, cold, the chill cold at the back, at my back. Through to my, my feet was so numb. And when I sat in the bath, that I took a deep breath and I couldn't do it anymore. So I just came out of the bath, went straight to the cold bed again, pulled a duvet over my head and I called. My manager at work, and I said, I don't feel too well to come to, to work. 
and I knew if I don't go to work, I don't get paid. Mm, so it means my bills won't be paid. And that was my night, my worst nightmare. And I remember that it was a Saturday. And for no apparent reason, somebody who hasn't got energy, I don't have money to buy a bus pass. I don't have food. I just woke up from my bed and I walked again. Where were you going? I don't know. There was no motive. I didn't have any motive. I didn't have any plan. Normally, you, you, before you go to bed, you, you plan. I'm going to wear this tomorrow. I'll take this bus. I'll come off this bus. Maybe I'll do a few things in the shopping center before going to work. You have a plan. But that particular day, which was a Saturday when I didn't have any plan, I just woke up and walk. And I was just walking just along the road. And I walk all the way to Croydon. When I got to Croydon, right at the front of Debenham's shop, somebody just gave me a leaflet. And I used to walk straight, not looking at anybody. Or down, or, or just walk my head down. So the person gave me the leaflet, I just took the leaflet. And I remember I had a very tatty brown bag. I just put the leaflet in and I just carry on walking to a point. Without any, any motion, I just walked back again, way home. And I felt so tired, very extremely tired. And I went to my bed again, the cold bed again, but I slept deep deep and I woke up at about nine o'clock in the evening and I just remembered that somebody gave me a leaflet. And that was when I took the leaflet and I was reading, I was reading the leaflet. It was just about an A5 piece of paper. I read the whole thing and I read it back. And all the problems that I was going through was at the back of the leaflet. Depression, suicidal thought, I can, I can even picture the writing now. Debt, everything, everything, sickness, incurable. The word that <laughs> stood out so strong for me was incurable disease. And did you take any action when you took that leaflet? Yes. What did you were, do? There was a telephone number at the back. And you didn't waste any time? No. <laughs> I dialed the you number. You nothing to lose, right? <laughs> that was my last option. And I think this, the, the strange thing about the whole thing is there was no plan in my life. I didn't have any plan. As I said, sometimes even before you go to bed, you said, oh, I'm going to wear this dress, and I'm sure this dress will go with this bag. I didn't have anything like that. I didn't have anything like that. It was just a normal life that I get up in the morning, wash my face, clean my teeth, go to work, come back home. That was the only thing that I knew of. And the bills come in. So as soon as I come from work and I see an envelope, I know this is coming from Barclay Card. I know this is coming from another credit card. I could tell from the envelope, even without turning the envelope, mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. So when you called this, this phone line, what did they tell you and what did you do? Somebody spoke to me, mentioned the name, but I can't remember the name now. And he said, oh, this is so, so, and so, and how can I help you? And for a very good, about, I would say about five minutes, I, I was speechless because I didn't know where to start from. And I didn't know why I called the number. And I said to the person that I need help. And the person said, what can I do to help you? And I said, I have a leaflet here, but whatever is written at the back of the leaflet concerns me, and I need your help. So why are you calling for us at Croydon? Oh, we have so so and so and so in Croydon. I said, what do you mean? I've lived in Croydon for more than 10 years. But what you are telling me, I've never heard of it and I've never seen it. So 12 to 14 London Road, go there. And I'm going to give your name to the person there. So make sure you go there. So it was a, a, a Saturday evening, Sunday morning. I was the first person behind the door, <laughs> first person. 
And I remember the first service was seven in the morning. And I remember the pastor very well, the person who opened the door. Wait, you had this, um, not hatred, but you had this feeling about church or religion all your life because of your childhood. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you find yourself again in front of a church. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing about the whole thing was, though I was going through all those problems, I was still going to church. I was going to church then, mm -hmm. yes. But as I said before, the way that I was going to church when I was younger, it was the, the same, same thing. thing that I was going through. Mm -hmm. Going to church because of the credit cards that I have taken the money from to buy clothes and buy shoes and buy bags to the church for everybody to see that I'm also part of the human race. Just an appearance. Appearance. And I come back and if you ask me what the person preached about what the pastor said, I wouldn't be able to tell you. And at this place that you went to, what was the positivity that you got in that place? As I said before, the, it was the same thing that I was, going, I was going to way back home. So it was the same church that I came to, because it's a worldwide church anyway. So the same principles there were the same principles that I was practicing here. Mm -hmm. Coming back, going out of married men, going to parties that I'm not supposed to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even not with invitation to be at the party. But in this new one that you went to as well? Yeah, it was the same church. It was the same church. So the same thing that I was doing way back when I was a kid, I came here and I was doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So though I was in debt, I was sick, I was lonely, I was still going to church. Mm -hmm. But it didn't change my life. But not the one that you got the leaflet from? No, not the one okay, I got so the leaflet. this is the one? Yeah. So how, what did you get in this one? So when I walked in, at the back of my mind, I thought every church has got like candles and oils and what have you. But when I walked in, it was just like a, a meeting place. And when I sat down, I felt so good within myself. But I was crying inside. And the thought that came to my mind was, what can they do to help me? What can they do to help me? But when the preaching was going on, I knew. It felt like, at one point, I was wondering whether the person that I spoke to the night before have said something to the pastor preaching. Because everything that the pastor was preaching was about me. Everything, everything. The strong word that st stood out for me was loneliness. So I thought maybe the person that I spoke to the night before might have said something to, but at the same time, I didn't say anything. I didn't open up to the person over the phone. So how would the person know what I was going through to tell someone else? Mm -hmm. And that was when I took it very seriously. So I had to listen. And I, uh, at that point, I felt so, I felt that the pride just dropped. The pride that made I... made you realize how low you were. Yes, in. that I'm nothing. That is what the sense that I had, that I'm nothing. So I, I listened very patiently and very... I was taking every word. And soon after the service, the pastor said, whoever is, has been here for the first time should come and speak to you if you want to. Should come and speak to me. And I, I was the first person there. I was the first one. So when I shook his hand, he said, oh, are you by there? I said, yes, yes. And the way I was received, I've never felt like that, ever, ever. The warm welcome. And what surprises me the most was, uh, there was so much order. Everything was in order. And it stood out for me. And I was wondering, what is this? Discipline, I could see this because I wasn't a very disciplined person. I've never been disciplined. So when I saw that, I, I was a bit surprised. So after I've spoken to the pastor and he said, I told, I, I was very, that was the first time I was able to speak out mm -hmm. and All tell somebody, and tell somebody what I've been through. Yeah. But something that I couldn't speak about was the debt and the suicide I thought. I felt so humiliated of telling anyone, so I couldn't say that. So he looked at me and said, 
whatever leaflet, uh, he had the leaflet then. Mm -hmm. So whatever the leaflet says, there are so many specific days that you can come and join them in a meeting to help you Tackle to... Tackle this problem. Exactly. And the first one that stood out for me was the debt, which was a Monday. So when I went home, after I've spoken to him and I went home, and I realized that if Monday is for debt, immigration and court cases, which I have, and the Tuesday is for healing, and the Wednesday for spiritual life, which I didn't understood then, but I knew if you have a spiritual life from the service that I received, if you, if you are strong in your spiritual life, then you can overcome all that. Mm -hmm. And then the Thursday, the family problem where my auntie doesn't speak to my mom and my mom doesn't speak to my uncle. I need the Thursday. And then the Friday was a different thing, which I've never heard before. And I, yes, then this would be good for me. <laughs> so when I went home, I decided to follow what is at the back of the, the A5 paper. And the Monday I was the first person there at 7.30. The Tuesday I was there, the Wednesday I, and I enjoyed it so much that I just didn't want to be on my own anymore. I just, anytime I go home, I just want to get out and be with where those people are. Mm -hmm. So what were you receiving there? Eventually it was a church, yeah, right? Completely different than the one that you used to attend. Exactly. And no emotion for sure because mm. you said that the, the things that he was speaking was relating to mm. you. And what, what did you do with the things that were said to you? And if anything was done to you as well, like any, any sort of prayer or advice for you to overcome your problems? The first because eventually your life is no longer the same, mm -hmm. right? As far as I know, your life is no longer the same. How did this change happen? The first thing that I went in a Monday, normally I go before the, the, the service will start. The meeting was start. That's what I was I used to do because I didn't have anything to do, and I wanted to know more. Curiosity, I was really really curious at the time, so I can even go there if the service was start at seven thirty. I can even be there by six o'clock, and the moment you sit down, somebody will come and speak to you. And I've never seen this before, where you go to places and people come up to you wanting to find out what you are doing and how you are doing, and the first. It, First thing, how are you? I was, mm. is the person talking to me? It was genuine because all your life, or most part of your life, you just had no one there for you. No. You were just very lonely. Exactly. And plus, you had nothing to offer, right? And still, I, I can fully understand what you're saying, because genuinely, people would come to you not looking at what you had to offer and just be glad to help mm -hmm. you. That was what I... I was really surprised. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know why they do that. That was why. The question, anytime I was going to church, the question I asked myself was why? Why are they doing it? What for? Are they going to take advantage of me? Just like the world has taken so many advantages of me. Mm -hmm. Because I grew up to know that anybody who will come closer to me, there must be something the person is looking for in my life. So this is exactly how I was looking at them for. And the first person that I spoke to in the church was somebody who advised me about my financial problems. Mm -hmm. The first person that I spoke to. Did things change, Father, because we are running out of time now? Did things change for you? It changed, but it was a gradual process. Eventually, I don't think 25,000 pounds were wiped off just like that. Because it was a miracle, I believe, mm. right? Mm. Because 25,000 for a person like you, you're just not earning enough money, didn't have anything in the house. And today you can be here sitting down, speaking about this openly to everyone. Mm. Eventually you overcame this um, completely. But as you said, it wasn't overnight. No, mm. no, it wasn't. But the first thing that I realized changed in my life was the first three months I was able to get a three year um, what do you call it? Um, a three year compassionate leave to remain in the country. Mm -hmm. So that made me have the opportunity to work more. It was already something happening yeah. to you. Yeah. yeah. So I had the courage to go out looking for jobs. That would give you better pay. That would give me better, to make sure that I've been paying my debt on time. 
because because I wasn't paying the debt on time, I paid late payment and what have you, and the interest was piling up. But the first thing that I realized was I was free from there within the first, I think it was the first three months. So I was able to work more, and I had the courage to go and register with a GP to get the hepatitis sorted. And the hepatitis treatment, which I should have done for 58 weeks, I did it for 38 weeks, and I was completely cleared of mm. chronic hepatitis C. Because what I used to do is, I had to inject myself every day. Mm -hmm. And it has to be different places, because they were scared of me having infection. So I had to inject four places every day. So that got completely cleared up? Got completely yeah. cleared up. And what about your debts? Gradually, I started paying them. And then this person that I met in the church helped me to write letters to the creditors to stop the interest. Some mm -hmm. of them accepted, some didn't. And I pursued writing letters so to you them. So you were not just sitting down and saying, you know, God, do something. No. Right? It was an eye-opener. Mm. Because when she told me that you can write letters to reduce your interest, interest I was, this must be nonsense. Who, who would accept me? But when I started writing the letters, some of them would write back to say that, no, we can't. And it got to a point that I had a company who consolidated all their debt into one so that I could pay less than what I was paying here and there. And within a short time, I think it went on for about two years, and the debt was... 25,000 pounds. Yeah. Completely? Yeah, wiped off. Within two years? Yeah. For a person that was trying to commit suicide, received a leaflet, saw it as an opportunity, went there and received a prayer and a guidance and you really could relate to what was said and you kept on going, you are here today. Yeah. Right. And the good thing about it is I began to love myself, which I never did before. Mm. I began to believe in myself because if I could write a letter to a company to accept me, not paying too much interest, then there's other things I can do. I can be bold and go to a place and look for a job. Then I'll be bold to, to do better things for myself. And then I became so wise about money. At the end of the month, it was this same person that I met in the church, said, Vida, at the end of the month, look at how much you are earning and how much you are expending and make sure you have a surplus mm -hmm. to spend on. So I, I disciplined myself, I go ac strictly according to my budget, not exceeding. Sometimes I'll see something like a pair of shoes, a handbag in the shop, and I'll turn the other way. Mm -hmm. Now, it was interesting because before you mentioned that you used to shop because you felt empty, mm. but now that you were attending this place, you were going to shop, you'd see something in a shop, but this time you were able to control yourself. So what, what was actually going on inside of you? Did you now feel fulfilled inside and that's why you weren't shopping? I, How I, were you inside? I, I believed in myself and I, I, I knew that because I was praying a lot, I was reading my Bible a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And it gave me a different meaning compared to how I was reading when I was a child. Mm -hmm. So everything that I read, I take it seriously. And any time I go to the meetings, whatever the pastor tells me, I take it very, very seriously. And I realized I was my own enemy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there was no dancing and singing anymore? No. Right? No. It was something more intelligent, exactly. more... Exactly. Yeah, because uh -huh. it wasn't just like a church that I used to go to. It was teaching you the right things. Mm -hmm. The right exactly. Mm -hmm. no. So Vida today is completely different. Completely Happy? different. Happy? Yes. Not depressed or suicidal yes. anymore? Because I quite remember I said to myself, the same road that I walked on with my head down, I want to walk the same road with my shoulders high and my head straight. <laughs> and now I'm proud of that. Wow. Sometimes I just want to jump for joy. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. And how, how long has this been? It's about four years. Four years now. Four years. Completely yeah. different. Yeah. June this year will be four years. Thank you very much for sharing mm. your story with us. Thank you very much. And for sure Thank it you. has benefited a lot of people yeah. because maybe you are right now living in this situation and you are just like Vida. You don't know what to do. You are sinking in debt. Your life is just all over the place. Family members are not talking to each other. Maybe you have a chronic disease and you just want to be free. And just like Vida said, there were times that she felt she was in a dark room and she couldn't 
go anywhere or do anything because she didn't know what to do. And maybe you're feeling like this and perhaps this program or what she's been saying is the leaflet that she received on the day. Mm. What, what she's been saying relates completely to what you're living right now. And it's, it's starting to give you a sense of hope, of a way out. Take it, because you have nothing to lose. If your life is going down and you are watching this program right now, this is an opportunity for you to make a change and put an end to all the suffering and the pain and the slavery that you might be living in your life. Again, nothing is going to happen overnight. No. But it's, 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 no. It, it can start somewhere, yeah. right? The first day you went, it was the beginning of something. Mm. And I do believe that this is something that you should um, work on. As she went to this place, there is a day that focuses on different problems, as far as I can remember. Monday for finances, Tuesday for your health, Wednesday is for your personal okay. growth, Thursday for family problems, Friday for um, cleansing and spiritual problems, right? You're no longer the same Vida. No. So, no. in the same way that Vida could change, you can change as well. If you are thinking of giving up, you are, if you are thinking of ending your life, ending it all because you just don't see a way out, don't do it. Don't do it because if this woman manages to change, you can do the same. All right? So, uh, if they want more information, Chris, I don't think we're going to make any prayer okay. tonight because after what she said, they know all, what to the, do. <laughs> all they know what to do. Yeah. They need to do what she did. Right? Okay, if they yeah. want more information mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, so if you want more information, you can visit this website, uckg.org. And there's also a 24-hour helpline you can call, the same number that Vida called when she needed help. And that's 020-7686-6000. Vida, thank you so much thank for sharing for that. It was really powerful stuff. It was really stuff. inspirational. Really, thank really you good. And Pastor, me. thank you as well. Thank you. Much. It was a pleasure. And Finding Answers will be back again at 6 a.m. And also at 11 p.m. with more real-life stories to brighten up your day and to show you that things can be completely different for you. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye for now.